with great material wealth easily accessible from the ground in vast stretches of hyper-fertile land, the early millennia of the Adiks were prosperous. With such an abundance of necessities, there was little incentive to migrate or learn to adapt to their surroundings, and most individuals had a great amount of free time to explore the arts or perfect even the most mundane of creations, which they traded with others across their world. As a result, merchants hold a lot of influence in the Adik society, and a single common language was formed early in their development. Individuals are named at adulthood based on their personality rather than at birth. They attribute their fortune to the gods, and thus tend to be spiritualistic in nature. Abundance, combined with minimal predatory flora or fauna, has formed a deep sense of admiration for other life, rather than seeing it as competition. Little did they know their prosperity would come with a heavy cost as the moon they lived on was being slowly torn apart by the gravitational forces of the gas giant they orbit. For a time, the effects of this was limited to surfacing the otherwise inaccessible nutrients and materials from deep within giving land's core. But eventually, volcanic activity and earthquakes plagued the Adik's homeworld at an unprecedented rate. Adik scientists soon confirmed the unthinkable. Within a few centuries, the moon would entirely rip apart, killing all of its inhabitants. The Adiks united as a people under a single planetary government, and they began a mad dash to advance technologically and industrially before time ran out. Now that the first prototype hyperdrives are being sent into space, they estimate there is only about three decades left before the end of Giving Land. I hope you enjoyed the little biography of the nation that I'm going to be playing as, so I'm going to be playing as the Realms of Giving Land. They have an imperial authority, their ethics are fanatic, xenophile, and spiritualist. They are masterful crafters and have influential merchant guilds. Their species is non-adaptive, sedentary, thrifty, charismatic, and enduring. Their homeworld is named Giving Land, and their origin is Doomsday. I am playing with all of the DLC enabled, and I'm also playing with a list of mods. There's a variety of graphics mods that makes the games look better, but the big ones that change actual gameplay planetary diversity and a few of its submods, which basically adds in a bunch of new planet classes into the game. I have UI overhaul dynamic, which changes the way that the UI is laid out in a much more presentable, easier to understand way. A few other smaller gameplay changes that I will mention as they come up, like a rework to how planetary invasions work. A link to all of the mods will be in the description. My goal is to focus more on role-playing rather than mechanical advantage. An example of this is my species is non-adaptive and sedentary, despite being a doomsday origin, which typically is a terrible combination of traits, but it makes things more dramatic. So you can look for yourself. These are my settings. I'm going to play. All right, so here is Giving Land. It is a lake world. The gas giant that I am orbiting that's ripping the planet apart is actually called Hell. I think it's really funny that that's the default name. It's perfect. I don't need to change it at all then. The leader of the realms of giving land is Queen Burden Delight. Queen Burden Delight believes that perhaps the Adik's people can find a new home in the sky and also is a champion of the people. Terrifying Jenny was initially a criminal, a mobster that had a vast underworld criminal network, has since become a symbol to the people that unifies the planet. Uh, so despite the state being mostly spiritualist, there are some that still don't follow the religion. Her focus on, on science and factual evidence has led her outfoxed disbeliever to being the lead physics manager and has an expertise in computers. There is a disease that the Adik's people are battling, a disease that is known as the Red Ailment. Red Riddance dedicated her life to curing the Red Ailment and successfully did so, and thus earning her the name of Red Riddance. And then we have Unruly Lunkhead. She was initially just a simple mechanic, unlike the other prestigious academia. Despite other people seeing her name as kind of a insult, she keeps it with pride to show the comparison of how far she's come. After his family was killed in an earthquake as a result of the planet's growing instability, he was left with nothing, no reason to live. And so, Graceless Grouch has volunteered to be one of the brave individuals that will chart into space and try and find the Adiks a new home. Outfoxed Disbeliever, I'm going to assign you to research quantum theory. Red Riddance, I'm going to assign you to focus on making sure that our people are fed. Unruly Lunkhead, I want you to figure out how to make powered exoskeletons. Graceless Grouch, it is time for your first mission. 
our sensors are picking up that there is a potentially habitable world over here. We will see whether it is suitable for our people or not. It's not exactly like giving land, which is kind of good because, you know, it would suck if we found a planet that was also going to blow up. The end is nigh. As earthquakes and volcanic activity on giving land continue to increase in frequency and intensity, our scientists are now able to more accurately predict when the end will come. They estimate that we have between 35 to 45 years until the planet detonates. Conditions on the surface will steadily deteriorate until then. The only good news is that the violent tectonic movements have made it easier to access the rich resources of the planet's mantle, increasing our production capacity. There is not much time. Now that Terrifying Jenny has been elected as governor, uh, one of her first initiatives is to invest in the slums in which she was born to give them jobs and bring them out of poverty. And we have scouted this oasis world. It has a 40% habitability. It's a fairly large world. It has plenty of energy producing capacity as well as tons of fertile soil. However, the mineral quality on this planet is pretty bad. All right, traditions available. Few things can match the strength of a content populace working towards a common goal. So thus, the Adik shall strive towards harmony. Graceless Grouch, thank you for the report. However, uh, we have more pressing matters. We must find planets. We cannot be sidetracked by anomalies. We need to, to spread out and, and search the stars as quickly as possible, so I shall invest into a new science ship. Magical Garters, she is a 36-year-old that has the Romer trait. Let's recruit her. So let's explore uh, this direction. And as well, I'm going to also send the construction ship in order to build a star base. We are pretty bad in the food situation. So Terrifying Jenny is going to invest into more agriculture on giving land. Let's see, Magical Garters has explored Menok, and there is no habitable planets, and the stars don't connect up. So I'm going to actually need you to explore down this way. Graceless Grouch, explore this way for more planets. I doubt there's a habitable world around a Magnetar, but we shall check it anyways. All right, let's buy some consumer goods, and let's also buy some food. Colonize this world with the Adixi people. Uh, it is a low habitability planet, but... We do not get to be picky. As the people plan to colonize Orpheus C3, its vast lack of any usable materials has led it to be named Sand Without Rock. Hopefully there will be another planet because it definitely does not have enough on its own to sustain the mineral requirements of the Adix people. To adapt is to survive and to surpass. I'm gonna need an extra farmer. Let's take one off of energy and put you on the farm. Right. So now we're making just enough food to sustain our population. A magical gardeners go this way. Pytham is an extreme bottleneck. So I need to survey these two systems because I'm gonna wanna put outposts on them. Oh no. Okay. Magical garters has found a hostile fleet in the system. Um, so let's assign aimless honey to uh, figure out more. I won't bother giving the envoys a backstory because until they get traits, it's not really worth it. We are woefully unprepared to deal with a fleet that size at this point in time. So we shall invest a bunch of our alloys into four new Corvettes. We have discovered a new life form in Kornagi, although calling it a life form may be incorrect. The entities appear to be fully automated mechanical drones built exclusively for some unknown industrial purpose environmental diversification by adapting to different environments we have learned to evolve and adapt faster we must get this the first adix colony our colony ship has gently touched down by the outskirts of a large oasis on sand without rock situated at the foot of a large mountain this ideal location provides shelter from the wind and has easy access to water let's continue to explore hopefully we can find a planet and then i can make a beeline to uh to claim it we have made first contact with mysterious aliens in the Rixum system. For now, we have codenamed them the New Aliens. We shall assign Pitiless Pendant to discover what these new aliens are all about. It does seem to be quite a few hostiles in this area. Fortunately, nothing in a critical choke point that would block us off from the stars. We have finished our survey of Akramalo, and let's go ahead and build a starbase there. Reports of the deep space drones previously encountered have been investigated closer. The drones appear to be the workers and custodians of an autonomous orbital mining operation established millennia ago. 
and then soon abandoned by all but the drones themselves. There is a new drone study available, however, our engineering is best used elsewhere at this time. We have located what we believe could be an ancient subspace gateway near Brune's Singularity. It appears to have been part of a galactic-wide network of similar stations which, when operational, allowed for near instantaneous travel from one part of the galaxy to another. At some point after its initial construction, its connection to the rest of the network was severed. It now only offers one valid destination, an uncharted group of stars just beyond our galaxy that our astronomers have designated the L Cluster. Even more intriguing, the gateway was built entirely by microscopic nanites of an unknown design. Although the gateway emits a faint power signature, it has been deliberately locked into some kind of maintenance loop that prevents its activation. Until we find some way of aborting this process, the Elcuster will remain beyond our reach. Intriguing. Oh, finally. Okay, we have found another world. It's far away. It'll take a bit to get there. Um, however, the Stenlar 3 is a savanna world. Lots of sinkholes. That's some minerals, plenty of energy debt districts, and some agriculture. It's better than sand without rock, that's for sure. And let's build a starbase over Pixam and explore this direction next. Land that is not being worked contributes nothing to our empire. Workers must be relocated in an efficient manner to those planets where they are needed most. Try to counter the sedentary and non-adaptive traits. As the first colonists arrive on the surface of Sand Without Rock, many are overcome with a sense of euphoria. Worlds other than giving land that are capable of supporting Adik's life had always been a theoretical possibility. But what if they were exceedingly rare? What if none could be found in our galaxy or if they had already been claimed by others? Those fears can be put to rest now. Sand Without Rock is a planet where Adixi can thrive. These fortunate groups of initial colonists are a start, but countless Adixi are still trapped on our doomed homeworld. We shall start with building a mining district over the very few precious regions of land that actually have access to minerals. We also must get this planet up and running as quickly as possible, so let's move this enforcer over there. Ah, oh, good. We have found yet another world. Unfortunately, this planet is a very bad candidate for settling, um, which is too bad because there are lots of mining districts available here. Not very much energy, but a good amount of agriculture and mining. We're still in trouble. We might need to settle this world anyways just for its mineral wealth. The entities encountered by our fleet some time ago are new wondrous forms of spaceborne life. We can learn to coexist with these creatures. Do we dedicate our scientists to immediately figuring out how to coexist? That would take way too much time. Sand Without Rock almost has his mining district done. Let's resettle the technicians from giving land over to work as miners. We're fine on energy because of all of the great trade value that we're getting. Losing two technicians is not the biggest deal. Let's go ahead and build an industrial district next. We need to make Sand Without Rock as self-sufficient as possible and move as many people over as possible. Let me get another science ship. Cheerful nonetheless. Welcome to the team. Despite the bleak conditions, Cheerful remains optimistic and has a positive attitude. Uh, cheerful nonetheless. You start surveying down this line. We have discovered another abandoned gateway, this time in the Opre EQ system. Unlike the previous one, this gateway has not been altered in any obvious way, and our scans indicate that it is still connected to the rest of the network. However, it is currently inoperable due to its poor condition. We shall resettle this metallurgists over to Sand Without Rock, uh, and then let me get working on a generator district. Conditions worsen on Giving Land. Earthquakes are now an almost daily occurrence on most of Giving Land and at least a dozen new supervolcanoes have appeared within the last few years. Massive ash storms blanket the skies, making air travel hazardous or even impossible in some regions. Temperatures have dropped by several degrees. Despite all of this, a surreal sense of normalcy prevails on the dying planet's surface. Rubble from collapsed buildings is slowly removed, the swirling ash is swept off the busiest streets, and the lava flows are, where possible, diverted. The people endure. And this is a effect of one of the mods that I have enabled, uh, Social Decline. It, when a planet has a deficit in one of the resources, the people of the planet will find their own, let's just say, illegal options. There are some drug houses forming 
on giving land, which is increasing the crime, but also providing some amenities, and it's costing some consumer goods. I don't have a whole lot of consumer goods to spare, so we shall invest into rehabilitation clinics to get rid of that. Uh, another gateway has been found in the Nodox system. Factions have formed, led by Queen Burden Light. They call themselves the Church of Metaphysical Cleansing. Their members support spiritualistic and conservative values. And then we also have the Xeno Tolerance Party, led by Terrifying Jenny. They have been pushing for friendly relations with alien species. The Church of Metaphysical Cleansing would like us to ban robots, and we shall do so. Evacuation protocols. We must establish a new home and prepare to evacuate our home world. This will increase colony development speed and uh, decrease resettlement cost. I should have done this earlier. And with that, let's also resettle two more technicians over to the new world. Let's get some food going on Sand Without Rock. As we resettle people over to Sand Without Rock, let me start demolishing some of the districts um, on giving land in order to save some upkeep costs. So let's demolish these two generator districts. Our curiosity about the universe is what got us this far, and there is so much left to discover. With that, let's go for Map the Stars, which increases survey speed, anomaly discovery chance, and ship hyperlane detection range. And uh, let's build a starbase at Gewarten. We have got a little bit of food on the new world. And also let's resettle one of the farmers from giving land over to Sand Without Rock. And Sand Without Rock now has 10 population. And I could upgrade the uh, reassembled ship center into a planetary administration. We're going to need another agriculture district to feed our pops here. So let's, let's get that first. Uh, oh, no. That is a complication. All right, so Yilion was a secure system that we used to be able to travel through when we, we initially pushed up this way, but now the mining drones have expanded their operations into the system, and we are going to need to clear them out if we want to make it to this savanna world over here. Let's see, they don't have any shields. Ship designer, uh, Corvette. These mass drivers are not going to be great against them. I think we should probably replace with all lasers for this particular purpose. How much will it cost to upgrade our 15 ships? 45 to upgrade our ships. I think that'll be worth it. Social decline has occurred on sand without rock. Let's see. Can't really afford the consumer goods. We got to spend even more energy to invest in getting rid of the these drug houses that keep popping up. This Starfleet has been upgraded. It is time to assign an admiral. We shall recruit Unruly But Trying. Unruly But Trying is very aggressive in nature. Let's continue moving the farmers over to Sand Without Rock. And at this point, let's demolish some of the agriculture districts here on Giving Land. So what I could do is resettle the political elite now and then upgrade the administration administrative offices that way they don't have to be unemployed for too long so yeah let's uh decrease job priority of the ruling class over to sand without rock and then let's upgrade the uh up to a planetary administration there's also a lot of nebula over here so we might be able to get some nebula refineries which will be essential in getting more minerals so let's go ahead and get zero g refineries uh unruly but trying it is time Lots of lasers going off. Their lasers are bouncing off of our shields. We're starting to shred some of their armor. They've only done some damage to our shields, but haven't actually pierced any of our ship's shields yet. Yeah. It's a good thing I built those extra ships. They seem to be going down without too much trouble. We are breaching through most of their armor. There's only one left. I'll focus all fire on that remaining ship. And we have eliminated all with no casualties. Good work, unruly but trying. You have done a fantastic job. Go ahead and head back home. We need more generator districts. We have found another planet, another oasis world. Cheerful nonetheless, go ahead and research the wreckage of the, the mining drones that we've taken out. Now that uh, this fleet has been battle-hardened, it is time for them to earn their name. Unruly but trying, 
She wanted to quell her aggressive tendencies. Her psychologist recommended gardening. While embarking on the year-long tour in order to take out these mining drones, she brought aboard her private quarters a little bit of gardening stuff, and the rest of the crew thought it'd be good for morale to bring some plants aboard to the bridge in order to liven things up among the otherwise metallic and rather sterile ship, and they decided to spread the tradition throughout the entire fleet. They are now known as the Green Thumb Starfleet. There is almost no amenities here, so the next priority is to get some uh, hollow theaters. Uh, and then we're going to need a more agriculture after these hollow theaters. Don't tell me there's more hostiles. Where is this? Amoeba pacification is going to take forever, but they have roamed into the Bastamore system, again causing the same problem we had before. Before the Green Thumb Starfleet even made it home, it has been tasked with taking out yet another ship. Green Thumb, turn around. You don't get any leave. Uh, ooh, um, okay. Magical Gardeners is in some serious trouble. Yeah, that was dangerous. All right. Time to engage. Green Thumb Starfleet, go in. Some shots have been fired at the little smaller ships, but they are repairing. We have uh, analyzed the debris in Yilion. They have managed to punch through some of my armor and dealing some damage directly to the, uh, the, the hole, it looks like. We did have to slaughter these creatures. It is a very controversial decision among the populace, um, but we need to clear the way. The Green Thumb Starfleet, thank you for your service. They have taken lots of damage and now they genuinely do need to return home. Fortunately, Magical Garters has, uh, successfully uh, survived the ordeal. Uh, let's go ahead and get you repaired and then back out there. Thanks for watching and goodbye.